British Rail 10800 Diesel. Now, admittedly, the British are probably pretty close to the top in terms of train ingenuity and innovation. And at the time, dieselization was in full swing, so it seemed reasonable to produce a new switcher-style diesel to replace some of the steam trains that the railway was still using. And thus we have the 10800, which in its first two years of service gained an awesome, awesome nickname, the Wonder Engine. Now you're saying, but, but you just said this is a list of the worst trains on this list. How? That doesn't make any sense. And you are correct, because this is where you are missing the very, admittedly clever, British humor. Um, the Wonder Engine uh, refers to the daily query from the operators. I wonder if it will go today. The 10800 was plagued with unreliability. It just didn't work at all for at least the first two years of its service. And it was such a nightmare when you're trying to roll with an engine, you know, it has to move stuff around to keep the railway moving, and it just decides, uh, you know, I don't want to work today. It's just... I don't feel like it. Allegedly, the issue was down to its engine, which was just pure and simply unreliable. It broke if you looked at it the wrong way. Now, in the 10900's defense, it was later rebuilt with a new engine, and it did pave the way for later editions of a similar type of diesel, the Class 15 and Class 16, both of which use engines that were far and away superior to the 10800's original monstrosity. And that's kind of why I put it low on the list. Yeah, it had a really, really bad start. But it was an early diesel that was trying to be taken seriously, and it had to evolve over time. Pacer trains. Again, we're sticking with the UK for a moment. Uh, uh, so, pacer trains are an odd case, because you look at them and you say, huh, it just kind of looks like a city bus that you stuck on top of a train axle. And you would be alarmingly correct. That is exactly what they are. Now, admittedly, pacers were not designed to be anything revolutionary. Quite the opposite, actually. The pacer was designed to it be a cheap replacement for the aging engines they were still using at the time, and give them extra time to get a more permanent replacement. Almost 40 years later, the poor British public have been forced to ride these awful Awful, awful things. They are some of the worst commuter trains ever devised, and that is purely based on the fact that they're cheap. This is footage of someone riding in one. Now, I've ridden on a lot of heritage railways, and I promise you, I have never, ever seen a train shake this badly that wasn't about to run off the rails. This is awful. I don't think the New York subway shakes this much, and nobody says a good word about the New York subway ever! It doesn't help that the interiors were also literally modeled like inner city buses, which is not made for lengthy travel comfort. So why, you may be wondering, why in the world have they been used for so long? Other than the little itsy bitsy problem that they never really got around to developing a replacement, the fact was that the pacers were, at the end of the day, cheap. Cheap to operate, cheap to replace, cheap maintenance costs, cheap everything. And yeah, the public hated them, but the railways were able to operate under trying times because these trains were so cheap. Thankfully, in recent years, they've finally gotten around to actually replacing these abominations and retiring them permanently to the, what I can only assume, outrageously polite praise of the British public. What is this thing? That is an excellent question. It is not a good steam engine. Quite the opposite. Under the white notation, which is how people generally identify steam engines and their layouts, this would be a 620. Namely, it has six unpowered leading wheels with two powered driving wheels. And I promise you, this design was ill-advised. Now. In its defense, this design came into fruition in 1849. So this is an old, old train design. And back then, there were a lot of really bad ideas when it came to train designs, because the technology was still fairly new. But in this instance, I think they already kind of knew what the problem was, because the designer really acknowledged it. Simply put, this train's issue is down to pure physics. 
It ran well. The firebox was a decent size, and its power output was alright for the time. The problem was that most of the weight of the engine was distributed on the unpowered six leading wheels. This is a problem, because the only driving wheel has less of the engine's weight. This basically means that this engine's tractive effort, namely its ability to pull things, was virtually non-existent. It couldn't pull anything uphill, ever. Well, not ever. It could do it, but not nearly as quickly or efficiently as any other train riding the rails at the time. The only railroad that ever gave these engines a shot was the Camden and Amboy Railway in New Jersey, and that is purely because their particular line of rails had basically no grades. There were no hills to speak of. And on a level surface, this engine could do just fine for the most part. But at the end of the day, the design was horrifically flawed for basically any other rail line. SR Leader Class. Hey, hey, British Railways, get off my list. Why are you still here? You, you take up more than half of my ch I'm not trying to pick on you, the UK. I, I'm an American. Yes, and we threw the tea in the harbor, yes, but that was like over 200 years ago, and you know, I, I, I'm a little over it. It, it, it. This isn't on purpose, it just happens that British Railways appears, based on my research, to have been slightly inept at their jobs. And introducing this, this thing, well, to be fair, they never actually introduced it because never got out of the experimental stage. I, but even at that point, this was ill-advised. Okay, so this is not what you think it is, and I promise you that. Maybe you look at this and you're like, oh, is that a diesel train? Or, oh, is that, maybe it's an electric train? Oh, yeah, good guesses, good guesses. This is a steam engine. I confused a lot of you. All of you are lost, because this looks nothing like what you expect a steam engine to look like. But to be fair, that was the exact point of it. The leader class was an experimental articulated steam locomotive that was designed specifically to improve the, the ability and capacity for steam locomotives on British railway lines. It was developed and set into the experimental stage during a time when dieselization and electrification was rapidly taking over. Its main designer, Oliver Bullied, Bullied? I'm probably pronouncing his last name completely wrong, I apologize. Was already an innovative engineer known for developing many successful trains. And he really liked steam trains. And he really thought that steam could be developed and compete with both diesels and electric. In his defense, he's not completely wrong. Steam had some advantages. It still does. It's just that diesel and electric were, at the end of the day, cheaper to run. But he thought there was a way to make steam that way too. And the leader was meant to do that. It did not. It did not at all. It was a disaster. For one thing, designing a completely different looking steam train, it was meant to look like a diesel to compete with the new, sleeker designs of the modern trains, meant you had to completely rearrange how steam engines generally are. This meant working from the ground up with new parts, and more expensive materials, and all sorts of stuff. In addition, the train had to be completely enclosed, which is a little awkward when it's designed to work with only two crew members on board, and the fireman and the driver, normally sharing the same space on any classic-style steam engine, were now completely separated, and the fireman was forced to work in a tiny cramped room that he could only access by crawling through a crawl space! I know it's an experimental design, but come on, someone had to have said something about that! Not only is that just inconvenient, but it's a horrific safety hazard! If anything went wrong, ANYTHING, the firemen only had a handful of ways to get out. At least with classic steam trains, any crew could just jump. They might get hurt, but a lot of them lived doing this exact method. That was not an option on the leader. And the worst part is that none of the issues I've mentioned so far had anything to do with the project's cancellation. It was down to, well, cost-effectiveness. Like I said, it was expensive. But then, it didn't perform very well in its tests. It just didn't have the output they expected. And steam trains are very, very good at overall power output. That's just what they do. That's, that's one of their best traits. Diesels, electric locomotives, especially at the time, couldn't necessarily compete with that. What they had, though, was cost-effectiveness. The leader 
wasn't cost effective, and it wasn't very power efficient either. It wasn't doing anything right. So yeah, they canceled that project. Which is a shame, because I do think Steam should have, and probably could have, been developed to a state that would have been more modern, and maybe we'd see more Steam trains on the tracks today. But I'm probably biased, because, let's be real, any heritage railway lover loves steam engines. They just... choo-choo, come on. Y y you gotta love it. N not you! Nobody nobody liked you. You, you. you didn't do a good job, I'm sorry. You, you tried... tried your best. It was not to be. The Soviet Union will never cease to amaze me in their abilities to produce both the best and, like, the worst things ever. They are so good at the extremes. Speaking more specifically, the Soviets really, really liked big, big things. You want the biggest plane in the world? You got that. Biggest helicopter? Yeah, they had that too. They just, they just really liked doing that. Now, they didn't have the biggest train ever. But they had a pretty big one. It was known as the AA-20-1. And it was an insane 4-14-4 locomotive. That is, I can't stress this enough, four leading wheels, 14 coupled driving wheels with seven axles in a rigid frame, and four training wheels. That is insane. Now, admittedly, locomotives with rigid frames that were this big did have some limited success over here in America. Union Pacific ran 412s for years, and the Soviets just wanted to do more of that, but bigger. But the Soviets also ignored some of the slight flaws with a rigid style locomotive that was that alarmingly large. To begin with, even Union Pacific engines, which again, fairly successful, were maintenance nightmares. And they weren't really designed to do what the Soviets seemed to think. See, a large rigid frame like this, well, you know, it has to turn at some point. The thing about the Union Pacific Railroad is that it had a lot of straight shots and a lot of flat terrain to work with. Whereas, the Russian railway did did not have that quite as much. And even if it did, it didn't, the uh, AA-20 had a sneaking little teensy weensy problem that it was just way, way, way too heavy. Not only did its huge weight sometimes damage the actual lines, but then it wrecked the points of the switches it passed over. Also, it was too big to fit on turntables, because of course it was. And it was somehow too powerful for the couplers they used. And if that all wasn't bad enough, the firebox was too small. See, steam engines, you know, have to make steam. And naturally, the firebox produces the heat to make the steam from the water. It all makes sense. Because of its immense size, the brilliant designers completely and woefully underestimated how big of a firebox they need, making it so that the AA-20 basically never, ever, ever got up to full steam. And on the rare occasion they could actually manage to pull it off, it wasn't able to do that for very long, and naturally it was also damaging the rails. As it turns out, running a big, heavy, weirdly powered locomotive over damaged lines and switches, you know, risks derailments. Which, which, which happened. Often. The AA-20 was never, ever used in proper service. It did make a publicity trip in, to Moscow in 1935, but then they just kind of threw it into storage, and they scrapped it in 1960, and they didn't state that publicly. Because it just served as a political tool. It was big and scary and, whoa, Russia, yes! But it was really, really bad at its job. I'm not trying to bash Russia. They, they made a lot of great engines over the years. But the AA-20, in my opinion, was the worst ever. Ever. The Triplex Locomotive. So this one's a weird one, and I'm only putting it low on this list because while it is a hideously bad design, it was super experimental. And it was only made to do a very specific thing, and to be fair, in that regard, it was actually super good at it. Triplexes are, well, there were a few that were made, but the one we're going to focus on are things like the 28882 locomotives. Stuff made by, like, Erie. These were experimental designs that basically were a bunch of steam engines strapped together. 
that that's basically what they were. You're probably familiar with stuff like the 4884, the big boy, which were widely successful. Those are duplex locomotives. These were triplex, even larger than a big boy. Now you may be wondering, well, why wasn't this more successful? Well, as it turns out, getting three frickin' steam engines to work in tandem with one body is actually a monumental undertaking. It is vastly inefficient to do things that way. The systems just weren't designed for this kind of tandem power. Now, in that vein, though, they were exceedingly powerful. These are probably some of the most powerful steam engines ever produced. But the problem with that is how efficient were they? And the answer is they weren't at all. Most were either scrapped or broken down after they were tested. They were very good at what they were designed to do, which was banking. Basically, they were designed to help heavy trains get over steep inclines. This required a lot of tractive effort, but low speed, about 10 miles per hour. And in that vein, they were exceedingly good at that because they were quite powerful. But they never were able to exceed a certain speed length and some of them couldn't even go faster than 5 miles per hour tops. Again, very strong, very powerful, but not fast enough. This created a lot of issues when it came to, like, moving them to, like, other banks. You couldn't efficiently put a triplex at every single bank in your railway. It just wasn't realistic to do it that way. And at the end of the day, they were too expensive to keep around when they weren't really doing anything that you couldn't just get a couple steam engines both of which could move at about, oh, 50 miles per hour at least, could do just fine. So like I said, they were scrapped or broken down at the end of the day. Now, again, I keep them low on this list because they were experimental. They were in their test phase, and it was pretty evident that they weren't going to work out, so I don't really consider them a massive flop on the basis that, you know, it was worth a shot. They looked pretty interesting. Like, they're neat and all. I like how big they are. But, you know, bigness comes with its drawbacks. Hilariously, George R. Henderson was granted a U.S. patent in 1914 for a ridiculous quadruplex locomotive. A 28882 locomotive. This was never actually built. Because, wow. N no. D do not. No, that was not going to work. Uh, I, I think they were just messing around at this point, if I'm being honest. But yeah, they were they were considering going bigger, but that, that never happened as far as anyone seems to know. They stopped at Tri, because once it re they realized Triplexes weren't going to work, going bigger seemed unrealistic, and I don't necessarily blame them. The British Rail Class 74. British Rail... I, I don't know... I, I, I promise you, I am not trying to do this. It just seems like British Rail likes being on these lists. I don't know what it is. Now, in the history of British Rail, they do have a long-standing issue of mismanagement. And they do have a lot of bad ideas under their belt. But I think we have to remember that part of the problem is that British Rail was responsible for a lot more train designs than a lot of other railway companies. Since most of these separate railway companies were combined into the solo British Rail outing, as I understand it, in the UK, it meant that they were responsible for every single rail line over an entire country. And while the UK isn't exactly big on the you know long-standing scale of countries, it meant that they were doing a lot of different things. So it's not so much that British Rail was necessarily incompetent, although in some ways I think they were, it was also that they were making a lot of different trains. So the chances of them having bad ones is a little higher, which I think is why they're still on my list and keep appearing repeatedly. This isn't the only one on this list is what I'm trying to say. Let's talk about the Class 74. The Class 74 was actually meant to be the next generation in terms of electric diesel engines. And at the time, this was in the late 1960s, dieselization had pretty much taken over and they were trying to upgrade and think to do things, you know, futuristic and exciting and they, it had a decent design for the time. And there were a lot of things about it that were very cool, mostly involving that they had an entirely electronic system where every single button, relay, things like that was actually controlled through electronics. This was fairly new at the time. 
Back in the 1960s, this would have been revolutionary, and in many ways, that was the case. It was very ahead of its time. Now, the problem is that the technology that went into its electronic design means that it actually wasn't very good at doing any of that. It was repeatedly prone to malfunction, and fixing it required specialists that, you know, knew about the new technology. When the technology caught up with the design, and they were able to consider fixing the 74s, the problem came down to the fact of efficiency. The 74s were designed to pull what are called boat trains, and these trains actually had dried up over the course of the years. Many people weren't actually on them, so the sole purpose of the 74 wasn't even there by the time the 1970s rolled around. So when it was a high time where they could have corrected their problems, it just wasn't worth it. It's a shame, too, because, again, the 74 wasn't necessarily a bad design, it's just the electronics weren't ready for what they were trying to do. It was ahead of its time by far too much, and the crews couldn't deal with its inefficiency. Failures were prominent, and things just kept breaking down. It made them unpopular. It didn't help the fact that they were super noisy, and nobody likes that. Nobody likes a train that makes, like, all the noise in the universe, especially a diesel. Steam engines can get away with it because they're kind of a classic sound, and people kind of like hearing them because they're so rare nowadays, but back then, and a diesel? Ew, who likes to hear a diesel? Nobody likes to really hear a diesel, especially one that's loud to the point of absurdity, which apparently the 74 was. So, yeah, it was scrapped. All of them were. And as far as I could tell, none were kept for preservation. The Alco Century 855. Oh, Alco. Oh, you used to be such a reliable name in the course of making trains. Oh, dear. The Alco Century 855 was a diesel engine designed specifically for Union Pacific. At the time, it was one of the most powerful diesel engines ever built. In fact, before the EMD DDA40X in 69, it was the most powerful diesel locomotive ever built. And admittedly, it looked pretty much the part. I mean, look at this thing. It looks awesome. I love, I, I love the design overall. It just looks like it's ready to pull some stuff. And when it was working, it was good at that. That's just the issue, though, when it was working. The 855 was notorious for consistent, repeated mechanical unreliability. It broke if you looked at it the wrong way. For such a powerful design, you'd think the opposite, but no, 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 no. It just kept breaking every single time they went to do anything with it. They were only in service less than eight years due to overheating and poor performance, and they were scrapped in 1972. Which is a shame, because again, I think they look really good from a visual perspective. It's just a matter of the fact that they didn't freaking work. Look, Alco, 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 my guys, my homies, my main men and women. You can make it look great, but if it doesn't function, it doesn't mean anything. The Baldwin RP-210. Speaking of big names in locomotive manufacturing that fell off, welcome to the world of Baldwin. The 210 was the last locomotive to bear the Baldwin name, and much like the 855, looks really cool. It's got that classic 1950s and 60s bulldog nose design, but it's sleek, really pulled back, and very, like, fast-looking. It's a very neat design. I really like it aesthetically. But again, this is a matter of form over function. Now, the 210 is a weird one, because the 210 was designed to work in three different ways. It was diesel-electric, technically. However, it could function off of its diesel engine, it could function off of electric pantograph lines, and it could also function off of a third rail. Now, the idea was actually quite a good one. Make it so that it could function on a lot of different kinds of lines, so the railroads wouldn't necessarily have to redesign their railway to accommodate the new engine. Now, on one hand, I'm not sure how much I agree with that. As good of an idea as it sounds, why not just make it a full diesel? Diesel fuel at the time was, you know, relatively cheap. That's why people started using them. Just just make it a regular diesel. Why'd you have to add the electric stuff? Because electric is cheaper. I mean, I get that. Maybe, 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 maybe just add the third rail, but the pentagraph 2 on top of everything else? Uh, okay, sure. Whatever. That's fine. Let's just, let's just do it that way. W did it work? No. No. No, it didn't. The 210 was plagued. Plagued with just, just so many problems. 
transitioning between a bunch of different rail types in terms of whether it's a third rail or the pantograph or diesel meant that it required a lot of mechanical finesse. And the 210 just wasn't up to snuff when it came to this. For example, in 56, on January 7th, one of the 210's contact shoe for the third rail misaligned with the underside of the third rail, and it passed through a switch point. The damaged contact scraped along the energized rail and created a, an arc of electricity, which set the locomotive's truck on fire! Otherwise known as being very, very bad. It didn't help that the pantograph that the locomotive was designed for actually couldn't reach New York Central's rail towards the overhead, like wire. It needed the, the small diamond-style pantograph, which the 210s worked fitted with. And even when the engines were working, and they often weren't, they were plagued with poor riding quality and numerous mechanical issues. The transmissions liked to overheat, the road mechanics were unfamiliar to the foreign prime mover, and often they had to forage for metric hardware components at the local Volkswagen dealerships. This is relevant because the maintenance manuals that were supplied for the diesel engines were only available in German. The point is that everything about the 210 was just a mess, which really sucks because again, it's a really nice looking engine. The 210 served for a relatively short amount of time. They were so plagued with issues that they, 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 they just weren't worth it in the end. At the end of their life, they were shifted to pure diesel work, which, to be honest, is probably what they should have been in the first place. They probably would have done a lot better if they hadn't gone with the three-pronged strategy, making them available on everything possible at the time, when in reality, that was their main issue. They couldn't do anything particularly well, but if they had done just one thing well, they probably would have been more successful. Like I said, this was the last train produced by Baldwin, and... Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. The Advanced Passenger Train, or APT, by British Rail. See, I told you British Rail was still going to be on this list. You didn't believe me? I wasn't making it up. The APT is a... Well, okay. I'm going to try to be nice here, because in many ways, the APT was an attempt to be revolutionary. Understand that back in the late 60s and 70s, all the rage talk was high-speed rail. Japan had thrown the world asunder with their high-speed rail line, creating a market for trains that some people didn't believe was there. At the time, air travel was all the rage, but the high-speed rail could make that kind of distance in the relatively same amount of time at a fraction of the cost. France would follow suit with their own high-speed train, and the UK was not to be left out. However, the UK had a problem. See, they didn't have nearly as much, you know, space to work with, and much of the UK's territory was already taken up by pre-existing rail line. So what were they gonna do? They couldn't just rip up the rail line because people used the rails in the UK. Trains have always been popular there, and there wasn't exactly space to produce a new rail, what about instead, if they didn't make the rails work with the train, what if they made the train work with the rails? Enter the APT. The idea was actually pretty ingenious. Instead of making high-speed rails with long, slow, curving turns that allowed the train to maintain speed, they would create a train that actually tilted on its own into the turns, so regardless of how tight the turn was, they could still maintain a pretty decent amount of speed. It was a pretty good idea on paper, and the design phase went into work right away. Except there's a major problem here. They didn't really consider that, the, again, the technology just wasn't there. I gotta give it to British Rail for trying to innovate. I mean, we just talked about the last time they did that with an electronic system. This one is about a tilt train, and back in the 70s, that would be pretty revolutionary but the technology wasn't ready yet. And when they finally debuted the APT, it was plagued with issues. To begin with, the train was not very enjoyable to ride. It was rough, at best. And the tilt on the train was so quick and people couldn't judge for it that it tended to make passengers physically ill. People already suffer from motion sickness on regular trains. The fact that this train went out of its way to tilt at the same time meant that people suffering from this actually had a worse time on the train. In addition, the APT actually couldn't maintain its 
high speed for very long because it had to share the rail with other slower trains, which for some reason British Rail didn't think to, you know, consider the fact that there would be other trains that were like in the way, they would be going as fast, and ABT would have to slow down, and it, it would defeat the purpose of this ridiculously expensive project. Technically speaking, the APT was produced twice. Once in 1970, the other time in 1977 and 1980. Its first introduction was a disaster, but its second one was much better. They had corrected the tilting issue and made it so that the trains were actually pretty okay to ride by then. But by then, the hype was over. People had already decided the APT was a complete piece of crap and there was no change in their minds. A lot of people just didn't want to ride it and those that did found it enjoyable, but again, it was still sharing the rails with slower trains, so its speed was irrelevant. It still had to go the same speed as a regular train could. The fact was, unless you replaced the entire network with these advanced trains, it wouldn't matter. The hilarious part is that British Rail, it was on the right <laughs> track, because an Italian company bought the patents for the APT and actually produced their own tilt train, which then the Brits bought back from them and now use those tilt trains on their current lines? Wait, you got, what? I, oh, I know it's expensive to develop something, but you just bought back your own invention. I, goodness, this is a disaster. It just turned out so poorly in every conceivable way, even though it was really a great revolutionary idea. It was just before its time. The Pennsylvania Railroad Class S2. Now, I'm going to be upfront with you guys and tell you that I really had to fight myself on even putting this one on the list. Because, I'm going to be real, I love this train. <laughs> because, look at it! The, the S2 is a 686 steam train. We'll get into more detail later, but if you look at it, it's just... God, it's so cool looking! Uh, Lionel made a ton of of toys uh, of this train. I actually have two of them. One, one was my grandfather's, one was my dad's. Um, so like, I, I have a history with this particular engine model and it's just, it's such a nice looking steam train and and I, I adore it. But, but was it any good is, is, is what we're talking about today. And it was an experimental single engine. There was only one ever built and well, okay. If it had been a regular steam engine, it'd probably be fine. Uh, y you know, like, as they, as they had modeled it like that, I mean, it probably, you know, I imagine it would be okay. It's, you know, a 686, pretty big, pretty, pretty friggin' big. But, it, you know, it probably would be fine. But it isn't. This is an experimental steam turbine locomotive. Now, what's the difference there? Well, it's complicated. Uh, and I'm not gonna bore you with all the technical specifications because there's a lot of engineering that goes into this. But long story short, regular steam engines don't have turbines. They don't work that way. Steam turbines do have turbines and the power output is re revolving around the turbines and getting them to spin and producing the, 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 you know, the perpetual motion and things like, well, not perpetual motion, but you know what I mean. Like, you know, the, the motion and the ocean and the rails and the wheels and, ugh, I told you it's complicated. This was new technology. And it still is kind of uncharted waters in terms of trains because there's only been a few experiments done with steam turbines and trying to make them work. But the potential here is that steam turbines are highly highly efficient in terms of fuel consumption when compared to a regular steam train. In fact, Union Pacific also did their own experiments in terms in creating a steam turbine train, and those were failures. Was the S2 more successful? No. No, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Now, in its defense, it was good at doing one thing, and that's being going at speed. When it was going at a decent clip, high speeds, not only could it maintain that speed very well, but its fuel efficiency was outrageously good. It put a regular steam train to shame when it came to efficiency in that department. Because for the amount of fuel you were putting in and the energy you were getting out, its loss of, you know, excess steam or power was minimal compared to a regular, regular old school steam engine. Now the problem here is at speed, as I have repeatedly stressed, only when it was at speed. It's when it was going slower, and that happens frequently on any railroad, 
that problems started to crop up. The firebox had to burn extremely hot to keep the steam pressure up to, 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 to make the turbines go. And because it was going so slow, uh, it, 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 um, it, it, it ran into some serious efficiency issues at those speeds to the point of just being disgusting in fuel consumption. It ate so much fuel if it was go if it go go going slowly that any amount of financial kickback you'd receive from its efficiency at speed meant nothing because it burned up everything else when it was going slow. It just didn't work in the way they'd hoped it would. Had it been comparable efficiency to a regular steam locomotive when it was going slow, it probably would have been a success and we would have seen more made. But because it couldn't be efficient at all at slow speed, it meant that making more didn't make sense. It probably didn't help that this was about the time that, that a lot of railways were starting to look at diesel locomotives. And the reason diesel replaced steam is that diesel was, at the end of the day, cheaper. Cheaper to run, cheaper to do everything. Could steam turbines have superseded that and possibly be even, even better than, you know, diesel with newer designs or better technology? Possibly. But the amount of financial input that Pennsylvania Railroad would have had to put in in order to make that work just wasn't feasible. It just didn't make any sense for them. So unfortunately, the S2 was considered a failure and it was scrapped. But man, look at it! So freaking cool and a Ah, I hate that I had to put it on the list, but it's technically bad, but ah, it's so cool. So freaking cool. The British Rail Cl <laughs> British Rail. What is the matter with you people? Why are you doing this to me? Ah, I... Do you have a monopoly on crappy trains? Is that your whole thing? I don't understand! The British Rail Class 15, 16, and 17. Yeah, yeah, I put three different diesels on this spot because I'm not spreading them out to make up an entire frickin' list of nothing but British Rail nonsense. That's, it doesn't make any... No, we're not doing that, especially when all these diesels actually have pretty much the same problem to different degrees. Now, you may be looking at the Class 15 right now and saying, wait, didn't you mention this once? And yes, I did. Back on my very first list, I had mentioned the 10800, which was also a piece of crap diesel by British Rail. And I mentioned that the 10800s were remodeled into 15s and 16s, and then they were better, right? Well, I did say that, but understand that I probably should have given further context. On the basis that saying that the class 15s and 16s and 17s are better than the 10800 is kind of like saying it's better to be punched in the face by your neighbor when compared to being punched in the face by Mike Tyson in his prime. Like, that's a true statement, but you'd really just rather not be punched in the face. And that's kind of the deal with these. All right, so first of all, understand that all these engines were created and, you know, procured by British Rail under their 1955 modernization plan, where things were going to be sleek and cool and bring the British Rail into a new age of enlightenment and power, and uh, things did not go according to plan. I feel like British Rail's problem is that they keep trying to take shortcuts to accomplishing their goals rather than doing anything the correct way. Um, I, I think that that's really, really their biggest issue. Because that's pretty much what happened. They got all these diesels, but they didn't really do, you know, any kind of detail work on making sure, like, if you had focused on just getting one really good diesel at a time, you probably would have been better off instead of getting a whole bunch of crappy ones. And that's pretty much what happened here. Glass 15's biggest issue was the engine. Much like the 10800 in, okay, yes, again, better than the 10800's engine. But the, but the Class 15 had, had Paxman engines. And as delivered, they were found to require excessive maintenance to avoid any kind of, you know, failure, which they did a lot. And even after modification, they still failed. The 16s were even worse because they had the same engines, but in their case, 
they were designed with poor ventilation to the engines, so they would fail even more often when compared to the 15s because of that problem. And then you had the Class 17s, which were a complete and total friggin' disaster. For whatever reason, in its case, they just failed miserably. All, all the friggin' time. This design was not suited to be pulled to building heavy freight trains, which is oddly what they wanted it for. And even after extensive modifications, the engines just never worked nearly as well as they needed to. The 17s were in fact so bad that it was estimated that they were they had about a 60% chance of op being available to run at any given time. And you know, imagine you have a vehicle like that, like a, like a car. Like like you have to get up for work the next morning, but there's a 60% chance that your car will work. Which means there's a 40% chance that your car won't work. Those are really bad odds for a vehicle you need to use every day. These things were awful and were retired pretty friggin' quick. None of these classes lasted particularly long. The 15s stood out a little longer than the other two, but even they were considered pretty crap overall. And boy howdy, British Rail, stop doing this to me! I don't like doing this to you! Do you enjoy it? Do you? Because maybe that's why. General Electric U50C. Not to be confused with the General Electric U50. Those were pretty decent. The U50C was supposed to be an evolution of the U50. They look a little funny. I'm sure you've probably noticed that like, they're, they're, they have a very distinctive design to them. A bit odd, but you know, if they run, they run, you know, whatever. Okay, fair enough. But the thing about the U50C was this. The whole point of the U50C was to lighten the overall weight of the U50s. The U50s used eight axles, but the U50Cs were supposed to only use six. Because there were going to be less axles, therefore less weight distribution overall, they had to lighten things. And one of the things they did, for example, was that they used aluminum wiring instead of copper because aluminum is lighter. Now the problem is at higher voltages, aluminum tends to get hotter a lot faster than copper will, to the point that electrical fires would happen a lot. And even when they tried to modify the entire trains with new wiring, they noticed that the, that the trucks were suffering from stress cracks. All this on top of issues with the oil pressure, cooling water leaking all over the place, oh, and the, there's the small itsy-bitsy problem of the, the, the dynamic brake grids, you know, melting. Uh, you know, just, just minor things. Uh, it was decided that the U50C was actually a complete piece of crap and probably shouldn't be used for anything, ever. After they were withdrawn, five were, set, were let out on for stationary power generators during a coal miner's strike. And then after that, they were all just sold for scrap because they didn't... No, 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 we're not playing this game with you, U50C. I'm, I'm sorry, but no. The EMD SDP40F. First of all, that name is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it the P40F the whole time, just so we're clear, but th that, that's what we're talking about. This diesel was actually created for Amtrak, so we're still sticking with America, and it was one of the first diesels employed by the new government-run company because... When Amtrak inherited all the privatized railroads, when they was all conglomerated under, you know, this, this government entity to keep the railroads running, Amtrak had an issue where all the railroads were using different stuff. And a lot of stuff could, wasn't really cross-compatible or was too old and dated, etc, etc. So they needed a new diesel that could do all their sweeping stuff and all their long-range, you know, large passenger trains. And that was what the P-40F was supposed to do. Did it do that? Well, it tried to kill everybody. The P40F had one critical problem that kept cropping up. It, 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 it's, it's a fairly minor case of derailing repeatedly, like 13 times in the span of about two years. First of all, doing that once in the span of two years is usually considered bad, but 13 times? Now, by some Christmas miracle, the P-40F never managed to kill anybody. Not the lack of trying, mind you. But the derailments were happening so frequently that an investigation had to occur to figure out exactly why they were happening. And there were a few things that they noticed about the P-40F. For one thing, its trucks were not very stable. They didn't ride very smoothly. And there was kind of a side-to-side -side motion going on with the trains so that probably wasn't helping. 
Another problem, and this was probably the biggest issue of all, is that these diesels were actually using steam generators for heat for the coaches. They were pulling old-style coaches that used steam heaters, so the diesels had to be equipped with them, and that implied that they had to have water tanks on board. The water would slosh back and forth as the train moved, and the diesel design did not take this into account. That coupled with the fact that it sometimes was pulling trains that were a lot lighter than it was necessarily, you know, designed for, meant the diesel swaying tended to get a lot worse overall than even it would be normally. And it is believed that all of this combined kind of made it so that the P40F really just enjoyed jumping off the rails at any given moment. Again, somehow never managing to kill anybody. Thank God, but yo, P40, what are you doing? If there's any consolation to the P-40's failure, it's that it paved the way for the F-40 PHR, which if you recognize this, well, yeah, you probably do recognize it. This diesel was a mainstay for Amtrak for years. The F-40, which was only designed for short commuter trains, actually managed to handle long-range lines extremely well, and in my opinion is one of the best diesels ever utilized by any railway ever. The P-40s, on the other hand, were just kind of just let go. It, it, was, it just wasn't worth the risk. Some were scrapped, and some were actually sold to Santa Fe. Santa Fe modified them a lot to try to limit their problems, and because they no longer had to worry about heating freight trains, they didn't have issues with derailments quite as often, if ever. Believe it or not, one of these is still preserved. It's currently on display in Boulder City, Nevada. So if you ever want to see a diesel that did everything in its power to kill everyone on board and somehow fail at it, well, there you go. Good work. The British... <laughs> the British Rail Class 28. I just can't deal with you people anymore. This better be the last time, that's all I'm trying to say, because this is getting outrageous. Okay? We need to talk about this. I am dying because you are killing me with this display of constant failure. Ugh. The Class 28 is also known as a Kobo Diesel which refers to its weird wheel layout, where there's a six-wheel bogey at one end and a four-wheel bogey on the other. Now, mind you, this wheel layout actually had nothing to do with the Kobo's problems. Also, it, you may think it looks a little familiar, and if you watched Thomas the Tank Engine growing up, yeah, I can explain why very easily. See, the Kobo was the inspiration for Boko, the diesel from that series. Boko is unique on the basis that, in the original series anyway, he was one of the only diesels that was super friendly to the steam engines. He never really, you know, treated them as anything lesser, uh, whereas a lot of the diesels were jerks. Boko was really chill, really nice, and, you know, served the railway well. And his namesake, the Kobo, did not do that at all! What was the problem with it? Well, there were two main issues with the Kobo. First of all, the engines didn't work. Like, ever. At all. They, 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 constantly, they, they failed. Constantly. So, so often that the entire class was actually sent back to the manufacturer for them to actually fix the problem because the railway was having none of it at this point. And to be fair, given their history with bad diesels, I kind of understand why they were losing it over this. Just a little bit by this point. Just a little bit. Just a, just a little bit. Oh, yeah. The other issue they were having, um, the windows kept falling out. No, seriously. The windows just, 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 just fell out when those windows was in motion. It's totally normal. I don't see why that would be a problem. It just, it just fell out. It's, it's, I, I don't know, no big deal. The manufacturer was able to fix the window problem, but the engines never really got any better. And I don't really understand this myself, because to me, a big component of any train is to make sure it always you know, runs. So you'd think the engine, of all things, would you know, be the most tested component. And yet it seems like early diesels, especially over in Britain, just, just, just didn't work. Even when the Metro Vic Crosley engines were working, they had another major problem in that they had a really nasty habit of belching horrific black smoke out. This was partially due to their hilariously bad fuel efficiency. They would sometimes just dump fuel into themselves and then all of a sudden they just belch out horrific noxious gas. And 
you know, you know I, I need to stress, this was in the early 60s when this was going on. Late 50s, early 60s. And I'm not sure the word environmentalism really even existed back then. And if it did, it wasn't taken very seriously. You are telling me that this, this, this diesel's exhaust was so bad that even people in an era where, you know, coal companies could, you know, produce all the horrific, noxious, you know, gases that they, they wanted to, in, in that era, this train was apparently producing too much, you know, fumes for it, for it to, for it to be acceptable in that era. That's how bad it was. So, yeah, the Kobo was a miserable, miserable failure. Now, you may say, well, it sounds at least a little better than the, than the second spot. I didn't try to kill anybody, and that's true, but I only put Class 28 on the number one spot because this thing is infamous in British rail history. Everyone knows about this freaking thing, and everyone knows that it was horrible. Believe it or not, though, one of them managed to survive into preservation. Now, on one hand, I kind of dig that because I do think that their design is really nice. They look good. But they were not kept that way because anyone really wanted to do it. It's just worked out by coincidence. The research division of British Rail actually wanted one of these when they were taken out of service for the Tribology test train. What's Tribology? Well, it's the study of things coming together in relative motion. So like friction and, you know, wheels touching rails. So, you know, that, that, that makes sense. For whatever reason, they really wanted the Kobo for this, and actually used it for quite a decent amount of time before it was replaced. And even when it was replaced, the Class 15 Preservation Society, yes, that Class 15, actually signed an agreement to be the custodians of this engine to try to preserve it. So a whole bunch of rail fans coming together to, to keep around two of the worst diesels ever made. I don't know why. They were doing that, but hey, you know what? You know what? I'm I'm all I'm all for keeping history around. I'm all for preserving things for public display. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this list if I didn't at least somewhat appreciate the missteps in the course of rail history. So you know, here we are. At the end of the day, all these trains were pretty bad. Some worse than others. Some tried to kill some people. Some just had bad engines, and some had technology that just wasn't ready yet. But all in all, we can appreciate the fact that none of us have had to ride on any trains that have been on this list so far. Unless, of course, you rode the Pacer Trains from the first part. In which case, I am so sorry, because wow, wow. The London Midland and Scottish Railway 6399 Fury. Now, from the get-go, let's be fair to this thing. That is an incredibly awesome name for a train. Like, this engine has a phenomenal naming scheme right here. Look at it, it's the Fury. Oh yeah. And you may see this and say, well, what's wrong with that? It looks pretty normal. And yeah, outwardly it does. But the Fury was a unique experiment in steam technology. The idea of the Fury was to save fuel by utilizing high pressure steam compared to the usual steam engines using low pressure steam. High pressure steam is thermodynamically more efficient so it could have saved on fuel costs if they got it to work correctly. And for further context, a normal steam train, low pressure steam, would operate between 200 to 250 PSI pounds per square inch. High pressure locomotives, however, would operate at at least 350 PSI, sometimes far exceeding that. But again, the idea was to save fuel. Higher pressure meant they could get more out of the steam. Thermodynamically, it's it's all a bunch of physics and nonsense and things like that. I don't need to bore you with the details, but the point was the Fury was meant to be a cost-saving measure and could have paved the way for future designs utilizing high-pressure steam in a way that saved the railway's money. Did it do that, though? Well, no. Not not even a little bit. Uh, it, it, just, it just did it. The thing about high-pressure steam is that the train has to be designed around the idea that there's going to be more pressure inside of it. And the Fury didn't completely take this into account, to the point that it successfully managed to kill somebody. Yes, and in fact, this is the first time on these top five lists where I am talking about a train that, through its own ineptitude, did manage to kill a person. In its testing phase, it was used to pull passengers, as it was meant to do from the get-go. And it was approaching the station at low speed, one of its high-pressure tubes just decided to burst. 
And the escaping steam ejected the coal fire through the door, which killed Mr. Lewis Schofield of the Superheater Company. Uh, so, yeah, that was really, really, really bad. But weirdly enough, um, that accident had nothing to do with why the Fury failed. Ultimately, it was down to they just couldn't get it to run. Like, it was towed often because it frequently suffered failures. Therefore, uh, it, it was defeating its own purpose. It was meant to save money, and it never earned any money for the railway. It was always a money pit. So, development was ceased, and it was scrapped. Could it have been better? Probably. I think given time, maybe with modern technology, you might be able to get high-pressure steam to work, and then you have safety in mind. I mean, you know, it's bad enough when a regular steam train explodes or something, but, you know, with high-pressure steam, ooh. I mean, that could be really bad, so, uh, maybe it's for the best anyway. The British Rail Class 21. You know, no, I'm not even gonna get mad about it anymore. I-I-I-I-I- I've given up on you. I really have, British Rail. It, it has been every single list you appear at least once, if not twice, and I am just- I've, I've accepted it. I, I don't even know what I expect anymore. Um, it's just, it's just one of those things, so it's fine, 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 we're just gonna keep you around, you know, it's, it's, it's a tradition now. There must always be a British Rail type, probably a diesel, on these lists, because you guys failed repeatedly at your one job for a really long time. Well, I don't want to stress, not forever, British Rail did get their act together eventually, but not before they created the Class 21. Now, the Class 21 is another diesel-electric locomotive by British Rail, and it was all part of their modernization plan, and da 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 If you watched the previous episodes, you probably know where this is going, because literally every time they ordered a diesel so far underneath this modernization plan, with a few exceptions, it's always de been delivered with serious issues. And boy, howdy, good Christmas. Class 21 Sure had plenty of those! You want me to list them? You want to have fun with this? Okay, fine. Uh, well, the engines sucked. Let's just start there. They were just bad. Uh, because of course they were. But, but, more, more, more involved. Uh, the, their cooling systems, uh, weren't good enough, so they had frequent overheats, so that was good. Um, there was leaking in the engines, um, because they weren't constructed to the appropriate tolerances, so that was good. Uh, the cylinder heads often fractured. Uh, lubricating oil escaped into the battery compartment. Oh, and there's also the minor case that uh, engine fires uh, were actually common in this type. Um, so that was um, that was alarmingly bad, uh, horrifying, frankly. Uh, it was just just one of those things. To its credit, the reason Class 21 is a little lower on the list is because it was rebuilt into Class 29. The 29s were a lot better. Well, they didn't serve very long because by the time they were rebuilt, British Rail didn't have much of a purpose for their particular design usage. They weren't economical at that point. But the point is that Class 21 did eventually evolve into something that was halfway decent, so you gotta give it that. The Boston and Maine T1 locomotive. Not to be confused with the Pennsylvania Railroad's T1. Some people have suggested that one for my list, and uh, that's like my favorite steam engine ever and I don't think it was ever given a fair chance to shine, so I'm really reluctant to include it on worst ever lists when it appeared during the tail end of Steam, and we don't really know how good it could have been if given the appropriate amount of love and attention, which it just didn't get. The Boston and Main T1, on the other hand, uh, we, I, can't, I can't defend that way. There's, it's not gonna happen. Why? Well... Okay, you probably look at this and say, that looks like a pretty decent steam engine. I don't know what's going on with the front of it, where it looks like it's like a nun hood or something. I don't know, it's just an interesting way to design it. But other than that, I mean, it looks fine. What's the, what's, what's the problem? Oh, I'll tell you what the frickin' problem is. It was their four-wheeled trailing truck. These were two eight fours, just for clarification. The trailing truck was designed in a really, um... Well, bad way. Let's just, let's just say it. It's not even dance around the issue. When the truck moved along the track, it actually made contact with the engine's firebox, which meant that the firebox took damage repeatedly a lot. And this awkward motion of, you know, it touching the firebox at all 
Mental and locomotive suffered with track adhesion as well as just, you know, derailments. Uh, it, 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 they, they had derailments often enough to be annoying. Um, you know, namely more than zero. Was really what I'm trying to say. They, um, they, they, they just weren't good. The Boston and Main Railroad hated them so much that they literally couldn't wait to get rid of them. They sold a few off, a few to Southern Pacific and to Santa Fe. Santa Fe, in particular, rebuilt them as the 4193 class, and the rest were scrapped, and none were preserved, because, no, the, you, I don't, it, 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 the, the, the real, the, the rear truck was hitting the firebox, I, I, I don't even understand how that was overlooked, like, you'd think that'd be the first thing you notice, wow, part of the train is touching another part of the train, repeatedly. Um, that's probably bad. Maybe we should fix it. No, no, no. Better not. I'm sure it'll be fine. It can't possibly cause the train to fly off the rails at any given moment. No problem at all. The General Motors Aero Train. Okay, um... <laughs> I should probably... <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't even look at it sometimes. Um, I should probably give this thing a bit of context because, um... That's, um... Let's talk about the elephant in the room here. Boy, howdy, is that a weird-looking train. And, yeah, but at the time, it was sort of meant to be distinctive. The idea of the aero train was to push into the future for rail travel. And it was introduced in 1955, when people's ideas of, like, the future, namely now, um, were not accurate. That's, that's, let's be honest, the, the people's envisions of the future were, were, were relatively skewed in, in some ways, not all, but, but in some ways, so, but it was meant to look sleek, futuristic, next generation, you know, it, it, it was meant to look distinctive. The air train was also designed to help railways who were suddenly struggling with the advent of cars being significantly more popular, as well as air travel becoming affordable. So, it was meant to capture the public's imagination, try to get ticket sales up, and also be a good, you know, engine on its own. Was it? Well, no, of course not. It wouldn't be on this list if it was. It was terrible. But it has the weirdest problem I think I've ever seen on a train thus far. Like, this is so bizarre to me, I don't even know where... It, it's simple, but it, when I say it, you're probably gonna be like, how? So, let me explain this. The aero train was made mostly out of aluminum, and in fact was designed to be as light as possible. Part of this was to make it easier for them to produce more. Uh, materials, you know, would be light and easy to assemble, things like that, so they could be manufactured, mass-produced on a cheaper level. But in addition, it was designed for high speeds, so the lighter the train is, you know, the, the easier it is to get up to speed. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the problem here is that Somehow, and I still don't even believe this, the aero train was underpowered. No, seriously, it struggled upgrades, it struggled when the train was too heavy, it struggled under weight that was considered light by normal train standards. So I can only imagine how bad it would have been if it had weighed as much as a normal train. Now, in fairness, it was capable of getting up to high speeds on level terrain with a train that wasn't fully loaded. But really, you, you're failing at, a, you know, your one job is what I'm trying to say. Like, you can't even, you know, pull a train. Like, the, the whole point of a locomotive is to pull the train. I think what makes it even worse is that, you know, when I say it was light, I'm including the cars in that because the aero train was sold as a set. The cars and the engine were meant to make up one solid unit. So, the aero train was designed to pull the cars that it was included with, which were too heavy for it, even though they were lighter than normal car- Do you see how stupid this is? The aero train was sent out to a few different railways, Pennsylvania, Union Pacific, to name a few, who did run it a little bit, but problems with its ability to pull anything basically meant that it never stuck around for very long. The railways were unimpressed with it at best, and the whole thing was considered a pretty massive failure. Its radical design also didn't really catch on with people. Like, yeah, it was probably futuristic for the time, but at the end of the day, people just want to ride a train that gets them to point A to point B in a really fast manner, and, like, the aero train may look cool to some, but it, uh, doesn't do its one job, so I don't see the point at, you know, at that level. 
Believe it or not, the Aero Train did survive into preservation in many forms. Number two and number three are actually on display at the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and the Museum of Pre Transportation in Kirkwood, Missouri, respectively. In addition, several uh, theme parks and zoos have actually utilized its bizarre design on a smaller scale. Disneyland actually operated a small-scale version of the Aero Train for about two years back in the 50s, and the Washington Park and Zoo Railway in Portland, Oregon actually operates a small version of it to this day. On top of that, Ottawa Park in Rito, Nevada also operates a small version of the train. So I guess in a weird way, its odd design at least made it successful at capturing some people's imagination. Maybe it doesn't have a place outside of a theme park or a zoo, but hey, I mean, I guess that's a win. It still exists, you can see it. I mean, it's... It, it, look, it was really bad. It, it, it just was. Uh, it's a shame, but it, it was. And that's why it's here. Let's just, let's just move on. London and Northeastern Railway Thompson Class L1. Finally, I can talk about Edward Thompson. Oh, goodness. I could easily make an entire video on this guy. But since this isn't an entire video on him, I'll give you the abridged version. Edward Thompson is a little infamous among rail fans. He was the chief mechanical engineer of the London and Northeastern Railway between 1941 and 1946, and he designed quite a number of steam trains during his tenure, and... well, okay. In fairness, some of them turned out alright. Not everything he did was terrible, but a lot of it was. He had a bit of a bizarre design ethos, and he also really seemed to hate the designs of one Nigel Greasley. Nigel Greasley, by the way, is one of the greatest mechanical engineers when it comes to trains in British history. So, you know, Thompson was really going after a guy that earned a lot of people's respect. And he didn't really, uh, really uh, compete with Greasley's level of skill and uh, finesse when it came to trains. Now, I was hard pressed to find like a truly awful train among Thompson. Now, there were plenty that had issues, but a lot of them were either resolved or weren't as bad as a lot of the trains I've talked about thus far, except one. The Class L1 was a tank engine, a 264T specifically, and it's a weird one for me to even talk about because technically it's actually not that bad of a design. As a freight engine pulling low-speed trains that are very heavy, the L1 was exceptional. Its torque and tractive effort were exceedingly good for an engine of its type. But the problem is that it actually wasn't designed for that at all. The L1 was actually designed for passenger trains. And they were used for passenger trains. And this is where the problems became quite apparent. Not only were their 5 foot 2 inch wheels too small for fast outer suburban services, but um, because of their power output, again, that was very good at low speeds, the second they got up to high speed, they proceeded to shake themselves apart. Their axle boxes wore, their water tanks split open, and their oil pipes broke off! Literally, I've never heard of a train that's main problem was that it would literally shake itself to pieces. But that's exactly what the L1 consistently did. Maintenance was a freaking nightmare on these things because every time they came back from a run, something was broken. Something. How much? Who knows? It could be a lot of things. It could be anything on these. They were little balls of chaos. Every day was something new that was broken. And they never really got any better. Believe it or not, though, they lasted a pretty decent amount of time. They were built in 1945 and were withdrawn in 1962, towards the end of steam, and by that point they were under British rail. Which, of course, not what I expected. To be fair, towards the end of their life, somebody realized that they could pull freight really, really well and do absolutely nothing but that. So they were reassigned under freight train duties, and that made them a lot better. So, like I said, the L1's a weird case where they were terrible for what they were made for, but they did find a niche somewhere, and served pretty well until the end of their life. Also, none were preserved, in case you were wondering. Maybe I'll make a video about Edward Thompson going over everything he did. He was an interesting guy, and, and I do think he's a little overhated, knowing what I know about him, but to a certain extent, I get it. Many of his design ethos just didn't work, and the L1 just happens to be one of them. The London, Brighton, and South Coast Railway E2 class. Ah, finally I can discuss this. I'm gonna be real with you, I'm pretty sure the E2 
has been my most requested train to talk about ever. I get so many comments about the E2 and why I need to put it on the list. You got to put this one on the list. It's great. You need to, you know, it's, it's, it's so important to talk about this. And, you know, part of me gets it because this train is not great. Um, but it's also associated with arguably the most famous fictional train ever created, Thomas the Tank Engine. And I'll speak, you know, from experience. I grew up watching Thomas. I love Thomas the Tank Engine. I, you know, introduced it to my son. I mean, you know, Thomas is a great series. Brilliant. Absolutely without question. Reverend W. Audrey wrote a great series of children's books that turned into just this awesome children's series that, you know, will be enjoyed for years to come, I hope. And it, it's probably responsible for getting me involved in trains. So in terms of its design, I think we're looking at one of the most influential trains in history, but does that make it a good engine? Well, here's my thing. When people started first pointing this out, I knew the E2 wasn't great, but people were like talking like, you know, it's top five material. And the reason I put it low on the list is that compared to a lot of the trains I've talked about before and am going to discuss, the E2, okay, it's not good, but it's not terrible. The E2, came into being back in the early 1900s. They were delivered from the manufacturer between 1913 and 1914. Now their initial run, they did have an immediate issue in that their water supply, which tank engines carry on board because they don't have tenders, was inefficient. It just, there just wasn't enough to keep it going for a reasonable amount of time before having to top off again. So it was remodeled into a second series that expanded the water tanks to make it a little bit better. And that did fix that problem. However, the E2s never got around another issue, which is its coal bunker. The coal bunker on the E2s is just too small, much like the water tanks were. But for whatever reason, never actually expanded on it. And the result was that every time they went to do anything with it, it just couldn't hold up. It always needed to go back for coal way too soon. So, even though Thomas in the series is known for having his own branch line, uh, yeah, the E2 was, you know, tried on branch lines in real life, and it absolutely could not do it, because they were too long. Even, you know, even, even a branch line was too long. They did eventually get tasked with shunting duties later on, and they were pretty decent at that, as tank engines tend to be, but even there, they weren't exactly great at it, because they were very long for tank engine standards. They had a 16-foot wheelbase, and compared to some of the other tank engines they were using, whether it be the S100s or the Austeri 060 saddle tanks, which had 10-foot and 11-foot wheelbases respectively, it meant that there were parts of the yards that the, the, the E2 couldn't go where the other two could. So what I'm saying is the E2 just never seemed to be able to do anything particularly well as a result of all these faults. Now, that being said, I still don't feel comfortable sitting here saying that it's one of the worst trains ever, even though I put it on the list, because, yeah, only 10 were produced, and yeah, they were weaker than most of the other tank engines in, you know, most categories because of their efficiency issues, but they must have found some level of use for them because they stayed around for most of the, uh, the 20th century. They weren't withdrawn until the early 60s. Nearly 50 years, they were still using them. So it wasn't like they were bad enough to be scrapped or anything. But at the same time, yeah, uh, Thomas's, you know, origins, much like Boko's, aren't exactly the greatest. But you have to admit, it's the most iconic design ever. I mean, I mean, look at it. It's, 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 just, it's just a cute looking engine. I mean, it's totally appropriate for the series. So you gotta give it that much, I suppose. So, sorry, Thomas. No, nothing against you, man. You know, in, in your universe, you're great. In our universe, not so much. Great Eastern Railway Class A55. Oh, look, another tank engine. I'll, I'll be real. There's actually a lot of British stuff on here. Hopefully no British rail. But uh, it's a lot of early stuff. I, I keep getting requests for, like, British things. I, I don't know whether you guys hate yourselves or what, or if it's just a thing. I'm not trying to pick on Britain with this part. I just just dawned on me as I'm doing this. I'm like, wait, all of these are related to Britain somehow. Well, almost all of them, not quite. 
but you know mo most of the list so I, I don't know but but, but 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 britain had a long history with rail and there were a ton of different designs so of course a lot of them are going to be questionable you know it's they, they can't get it right every single time lord knows we didn't do it do it right over here in america or anywhere else for that matter like you know people mess up it's okay but the the, the a55 is a weird one because technically speaking it is an experimental engine so you can kind of forgive it a little bit because it was designed to do a very, 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 very specific thing, and they only ever made one of it. It was an O-10, O, tank engine. Ten driving wheels on a tank engine, which is pretty big. And in fact, at the time when it was created, which was in 1902, it was one of the largest engines you know, especially of its type, on the British rail lines. The result of this is that you had a lot of power, but you also had something that was extremely heavy. And the A55 was very heavy. But it was designed to do something very specific, and that's to test how quickly they could get an engine to accelerate. It was designed specifically to accelerate extremely fast. And yeah, the A55 could accelerate really, really, really fast. No question about it and could do nothing else but that. The problem with it was that most of its other elements weren't exactly the most efficient, especially for the needs of the time. But the bigger issue was, like I said, its weight. It was heavy. A lot of the bridges on the rail lines at that time would not have been able to take an engine that weighed as much as the A55 did. Had it been created, you know, 30 years later, maybe the, the bridges could have held up. But even at that, the point was that this was an experiment to test something, and yeah, it did it, but they just couldn't figure out how to use it for anything useful. Like, yeah, it could accelerate, great, oh, wonderful. Can we actually do anything with that? And the answer was, not really, no. In its defense, it was later rebuilt into a tender engine, an 080, and it did serve after that. However, it didn't even do that great even when it was rebuilt. It was no more capable than the Class G58s they were using at the time. So they didn't bother to build any more of it because it wasn't doing anything better. Or even worse, it just, it's just kind of there. It was scrapped in 1913. New Zealand Railways G-Class. Okay, this is a weird one. Because, well, from the get-go, um... The, 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 my viewers in North America may be a little alarmed at this engine's peculiar design, but I want to stress this. Um, this engine's issues have nothing to do with its weird layout, and this is not unusual outside of North America. What you're looking at is a Garrett type of locomotive. The layout was invented by Herbert William Garrett, who was a British engineer, and it's an articulated locomotive that's split into three parts as opposed to two, like tenders, or one if you're a tank engine. The unique thing about Garrett's is they kind of have two tenders, and the driving wheels are actually under what you would consider the tenders on this type of engine. This means that Garrett's tend to have very even weight distribution and pretty decent tractive effort. The tenders often hold water and coal, respectively, depending on how they're laid out. Every one is different. And there's quite a number of these. They had a lot of success with this type of locomotive, particularly in locations like Africa and Asia, who really enjoyed it. For whatever reason, North America never really got around to enjoying this type of locomotive. I think they were concerned about safety issues with them, because seeing forward is a little bit more difficult on this type of train when compared to a normal steam engine layout. But even so, it's a unique engine. And some of the Garrett's are actually very good. I, like I said, this has nothing to do with any issues with the type itself. This has to do with the G classes specifically. Under the white notation, they'd be a 462 plus 264. They were unique even for Garrett's as they were one of the few to employ six cylinders and a mechanical stoker was used to feed coal into the locomotive. At the time, New Zealand was looking to incorporate some new engines on their lines. They invited the Bayer Peacock and Company of England to suggest suitable engines for them, and they recommended, in fact insisted upon, these Garrett types. And this was, according to the New Zealand government railways themselves, against their own better judgment. With the way these locomotives were designed, they were powerful, but that was kind of their problem. New Zealand tracks were not up to snuff compared to England or even America. 
there were a lot of rule lines that were put down a little more haphazardly, so anything that had too much power on top of them tended to damage the rails, which the G-Class did. Repeatedly. The drawbars on the rolling stock broke wherever the engines ran, no matter what. And they were also incredibly hot, which the steam engines tend to be, but they generated such intense heat that in the restricted tunnels, which were more common in New Zealand at the time, the crews hated them because they were dying of heat exhaustion every time they went into a tunnel on these things. They were withdrawn pretty quick, but they couldn't just scrap them. They'd spent a lot of money getting them there. So they were rebuilt as Pacific-type locomotives, 462 tenders. However, even in this case, they, uh, they weren't great. I mean, they were better, but they weren't great. They stayed in service for a few decades, but they had issues with adhesion, and they also had a habit of having steam leaks. However, this could be attributable to lack of maintenance, because according to many, if the G-Class was kept up to snuff with constant repairs, they ran fine, but they were still highly unpopular and never gained ground when it came to that territory. Overall, the whole thing became just a total disaster. And I kind of hate the fact that I have to talk about the Garretts in this light, because like I said, that type of locomotive should not be blamed for the G-Class's issues. It's just happens to be the first time I get to talk about a Garrett, and this is where I get a bunch of comments saying, actually, it's pronounced Garrett or something, because I'm reading, and I'm America, yeah, I get it, it's, 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 it's Malay, not Mallet, and the, the big boy isn't a Mallet either, it's a, it's a simple articulated locomotive, and I just, I, I, I can't get a source that tells me the truth anymore, this is the problem with the internet people, everyone lies to you, but I try not to, okay, I'm trying here. Promise. The British Rail Class 22. I... You know... When will the torment end? Is really my issue at this point. Um... It, it's just... It, 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 this is... Eternal. I, I... I... I don't even have a proper explanation anymore. Um, it's just, it's just one of these things with you. I, I, if it is 1960s, it's, and it's British Rail, it's probably bad, is what I'm trying to say. It's not always true, but it, it, it feels that way. It, it really does. The Class 22, okay. Here's the thing about the Class 22. Compared to a lot of the other British Rail diesels I've talked about, um, this was diesel hydraulic, just so we're clear, um, it wasn't awful. But it had the same old issues that every single diesel they ever put out during this time had. Which is, on delivery, they were awful. Drive motors were unreliable at best, and their transmissions barely functioned. And, in this case, they couldn't actually be returned to the North British Locomotive Works who actually built the things, because a contractual agreement that apparently British Rail signed for whatever reason, said that no, any problems the diesels have are suddenly yours, buyer beware, I guess. Which is insane to me. However, the Class 22 should be noted as another example of a diesel that British Rail brought into the fold that started out really terrible. That actually got better. Because they had to repair it themselves, they did that. And they actually repaired them fairly well. They were introduced in 59, and by 1961, their reliability had improved a great deal. The problem then was that more powerful Hymex and Warship types of diesels were available that could do the same job, but way better. So, unfortunately, the Class 22 was thrown onto secondary duties, but in its defense, again, it did actually perform those duties pretty well with availability being rated at about 85%, which is a far cry from, like, every other diesel I've ever talked about under British Rail. So, can you consider it one of the worst? Well, yes, because it started out that way, but, like some of the ones I do talk about, this is one that did get better. So, even though I put you on the list, I think you deserve a bit of a pass. You got a bad lot, and no one took care of you. And when someone finally did, it did your job fairly well. So, compared to the other diesels, I think Class 22 deserves a little bit of love, is all I'm trying to say. Turbojet trains. 
by multiple people, actually. I'm gonna throw all of these in the same lot, because some people say this is only a Russian idea, and doing further research, uh, no, 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 that's not true, they weren't even the first to attempt this. That was over here in America. That was us. Hi. Take a look at this. This is a high-speed rail car with, well, what are those? Why, those appear to be two jet engines strapped on top of it. This is the M497 Black Beetle, and it was an experimental jet-powered rail car testbed that was used by New York Central Railroad in 1966. Those engines are actually supposed to be used for Convair's B-36 Peacemaker Intercontinental Bomber? And for some reason, New York Central was like, you know, what if we strapped a jet engine to a train? And the result is... questionable. The Russians would later also do this by taking the engines off of their Yak-40, but also apply it to a high-speed rail car, and do pretty much the same thing. In fact, they look remarkably similar. They weren't even the only two that did this. Now, these were all test beds trying to get the technology to see if it worked, and, you know, gonna be real, uh, it didn't. Uh, it didn't really at all. Well, well, it did in some ways. In terms of all being high speed, uh, yeah, they were fast. They were very, very fast. They're jet engines, of course they are. You strap a jet engine to something and turn them on, uh, yeah, that thing's gonna get to good speed, and they did get up to pretty good speed. Both of these designs exceeded 160 to 180 miles per hour, which was very fast for a train in those days. But the designs had a couple issues. A. There's already ways to make trains fast. The Japanese, again, Prove this with their high-speed rail line. It didn't just drop strapping jet engines to something, like your wily e. coyote trying to catch the Roadrunner, okay? Like, there's a way more efficient way to do this. And that's leading into the other issue, that these are jet engines. And jet engines love to consume fuel. They are not very economical. The only reason they get away with it on planes is that planes require that kind of speed to maintain their lift and because the speed and flying, you know, over obstacles is something planes are, you know, very good at because it's exactly what they're for, you can make ticket prices high enough to compensate for the fuel costs that you get on aircraft. But with a train, it doesn't really fly so well. Not only are there better ways to make a train go that fast, but you're never going to get the public to pay for a train that consumes all the fuel in the universe because it, you strapped a couple of jet engines to it. It just isn't going to work. Now, in some ways, these designs were a little successful because they did gain a ton of data when it came to trains traveling at high speeds that, you know, could improve other train designs. So it wasn't like they were totally worthless in the end. But they did have another issue that if they were ever put into commercial service, that was never, ever going to be solved. And that issue was... That ish... The issue with this... With this idea... It's not just the fuel you see, if there's something else about jets that you should probably be- Hold on! Look, jet engines are loud. They are very loud, even not involving sonic booms, when they're, you know, traveling fast in the sound like the Concorde did. Jet engines are noisy, and if they're on the ground, they're making a lot of noise. People get annoyed living next to airports and hearing jets all the time. I mean, I don't. I love planes. We can talk about planes sometime if you want. But there's always noise complaints about this thing. Can you imagine how many people would whine if you had a screaming banshee of a train traveling down the rails every single day, right next to their homes, shaking their windows? It's a jet engine that was supposed to be mounted to an intercontinental bomber that was designed to haul nuclear bombs. Look, I admit, the mad science going on here is pretty cool, but there's no way to make this a reasonable option, is what I'm trying to say. 